welcome to my coronavirus classroom. I'm Janessa Jacobs, and this is Digestive System Physiology. We left off last time talking about the functional anatomy of the system and kind of left off in the stomach. And then I did this chart to sum everything up for you. And today we're gonna go through the details. So, so hopefully you had a chance to look through your book and go over the important information, because here we go. So the first day, the very beginning of class, we talked about the anatomical structures and I showed you the gross anatomy of the stomach. It's got that cardiac sphincter between it and the esophagus that leads down into the cardiac region of the stomach. The kind of portion that sticks up is the fundus. And then here's the body and then that leads into the pylorus. This was the lesser curvature. This is the greater curvature. If we were to look in there, we would see, we would be able to see with our eyes these folding on the inside called rugae. As far as microanatomy goes, we said that there were gonna be some things we needed to remember for each organ, and one of those was specializations in the wall. One of the specializations in the wall of the stomach is that its muscularis externa has an extra inner oblique layer. So the muscularis externa, has an inner oblique layer. And this is going to help with the forceful mixing and grinding that occurs in the stomach that's going to mix the material you just swallowed with your gastric juice. If we were to zoom into the epithelium to see what's going on there, we would find that we've got our simple columnar cells But that also what we see is that we poke down, that, ep those, that epithelial layer kind of pokes down and forms these gastric pits and gastric glands. So if this is the lumen, so material is passing through here, then we have these gastric pits and gastric glands that are formed in that mucosal layer. And our, the gastric pits are gonna have these specialized cells called mucus neck cells that secrete an extra thick mucus. And that is going to be in addition to the mucus that our goblet cells are secreting, but our mucus neck cells are going to have this extra function of secreting a really thick mucus, and that in combination with the mucus coming from the goblet cells is going to create what we call a mucosal barrier. So we'll say that our <clears throat> mucus neck cells secrete a thick mucus that forms a mucosal barrier with the mucus from our goblet cells. And that's gonna be important because uh, down here in these gastric glands, we have these cells that are producing things that are gonna make hydrochloric acid. And hydrochloric acid is harmful to all cells, ours included. So if we make a nice thick mucus or mucosal barrier here, we can give these columnar cells some extra protection from that hydrochloric acid. So those are the first cells that we would find in these gastric pits. And then if we look down into the gastric glands, we see the cells that are going to secrete our gastric juice. So you can see in your book, you can look that we've got parietal cells and chief cells and these other cells called our uh, G cells or enteroendocrine cells. So I'm going to let you look at the figure in your book and erase this picture so that we can talk about each of these other cell types. So parietal cells are these cells that are responsible for secreting hydrochloric acid. Hydrochloric acid is going to do several things. It's antimicrobial, which helps with some innate immunity, but as far as digestion goes, it's going to denature our proteins so that we can get them from these big globby things down into their primary structure. And then it's going to activate this other secretion coming from the chief cells called pepsinogen. It's going to activate that to pepsin so that pepsin 
and can break down those proteins. It's also going to help to activate our uh, lingual lipase that was added in the mouth. So parietal cells, these secrete hydrochloric acid. And what this is going to do is denature proteins. It's going to activate lingual lipase. And it's going to activate pepsinogen or convert pepsinogen to pepsin. So really, if we think about it, it's the chief cells that are secreting pepsinogen. And so these secrete pepsinogen. And what that pepsinogen does is gets converted to pepsin. And what pepsin does is break these long chains of amino acids down into polypeptides. So pepsin is going to begin protein digestion. Uh, hydrochloric acid helps to denature our proteins and now pepsin is gonna actually start breaking the chemical bonds. So doing our chemical digestion. So pepsin, we'll say, is going to break our proteins into polypeptides. Okay, what else? Parietal cells secrete this stuff called intrinsic factor. And that is going to help with vitamin B absorption in the small intestine. Our chief cells are going to secrete gastric lipase. And if we think about where that was coming from, if this is my gastric pit down here, and this is my lumen of my stomach right here, all of those secretions are coming into this little uh, like ductule that's going to empty onto the epithelial surface of the stomach. These other cells, these enteroendocrine cells, are going to sit here and they're going to release hormones into the blood, uh, so on the basal surface, as opposed to releasing these uh, digestive enzymes on the apical surface like these other cells are. So we're not really going to worry about our enteroendocrine cells a whole lot. We'll just say for now they release gastrin. And so if we're thinking about functional anatomy, then here's the anatomy. Here, these are the cells, and here's what they're secreting. And so what's the function? The function of the cells that we find in these gastric pits is, again, to secrete the mucus that's going to help give that mucosal barrier. The function of the cells we find in the gastric glands is to secrete gastric juice. So what's gastric juice? Well, if we were to look, it's the mix that's going to be released into here. So gastric juice contains hydrochloric acid, it contains pepsin, it contains gastric lipase, and lingual lipase, which has been activated. That's the microanatomy and the secretions we're getting. So let's think about what the heck is going on here. we think about mechanical processes that are happening in the stomach or the various digestive processes that are happening in the stomach. The stomach is going to help with mechanical digestion because it has that extra inner oblique layer that is going to help with the forceful mixing and grinding of that bolus that you swallowed with gastric juice. So for digestive processes in the stomach, mechanical digestion is the first. We could say this is forceful mixing and grinding that mixes our bolus with gastric juice. Additionally, we could say this is due 
to the extra inner oblique layer in the muscularis externa. Okay, so what chemical digestion is occurring? Well, if we're looking at our major biological macromolecules, no carbohydrate digestion is occurring. We deactivate salivary amylase and we aren't adding any more digestive enzymes that work on carbohydrates in gastric juice. So what else is happening? Well, hydrochloric acid is going to denature our proteins. Then it's going to activate our pepsin, or our pepsinogen into pepsin so that we break those into polypeptides. So for chemical digestion, we're going from proteins to polypeptides. And as far as lipid digestion goes, it's pretty darn negligible. So yes, we activate our lingual lipase and we add gastric lipase, but really we have these big fat droplets. The best thing that we're gonna do is take these really large pieces of fat and get it down into still big fat droplets. When we get to the small intestine, bile is going to emulsify those fat droplets and that's when we can really begin lipid digestion. So primarily we could think about uh, what's going on with our proteins as being the most significant thing that's happening with chemical digestion in the stomach. Absorption in the stomach is standard. So nothing super exciting. We're absorbing water and glucose according to the cell needs and things, lipid soluble substances as well. So we'll just say this is standard. Water, glucose, and lipid soluble substances. Secretion, gastric juice. What were the components? Hydrochloric acid, pepsin, gastric lipase. That's really what the stomach is adding. Okay, what about gastric motility? What are the different types of contractions that we have? Well, we've already talked about this forceful mixing and grinding. So that's gonna be part of mechanical digestion, but it's also motility because it's contraction of muscle. As far as propulsion goes, how are we moving material forward in the stomach? Our primary means of propulsion throughout the entire GI tract is peristalsis. So peristalsis is going to move material toward the pylorus region, or we could say from the body to the pylorus, to the pylorus region. And as we really get down there in that pylorus region, we'll really get this nice mixing, forceful mixing and grinding. So that's what's under here. I'm not gonna write it again because I've got it over here. So propulsion is peristalsis. That's this wave-like contraction of the muscularis externa that's gonna move the material forward. And when we get to that pylorus region, we're really gonna do this forceful mixing and grinding where the extra oblique layer is gonna really squeeze on that material. And then what happens is that as that pylorus region is contracting, it's gonna about every 15 minutes blow open the pyloric sphincter and a little bit of chyme now, we're gonna call it, is going to enter the small intestine. And then that pyloric sphincter snaps shut and the material blows back from the pyloric region back into the body. So that is another type of movement and it's called a retropulsion. So what we could say, um, actually before we talk about retropulsion is that we could say as this mixing and grinding is happening it's going to relax the pyloric sphincter so our mixing and grinding relaxes the pyloric sphincter and a little bit of chyme is going to go through about every 15 minutes this is gonna happen, and then the pyloric sphincter is gonna snap shut and we'll have re uh, retropulsion. So mixing and grinding relaxes pyloric sphincter. <clears throat> 
time enters small intestine, the sphincter snaps shut. And this is going to lead to our next type of motility in the stomach, retropulsion. When that sphincter snaps shut, the material blows back from the pylorus into the body of the stomach, and then the pro uh, propulsion or our peristalsis is gonna take over again and move it like in a wave-like uh, fashion toward the pylorus region. And then our mixing will happen, we'll forcefully grind, we'll blow up on our pyloric sphincter, we'll let some chyme through, snap it shut, do more retropulsion, and this will occur again and again for six to eight hours. So retropulsion, we'll say this is the uh, backwards movement. of material from the pylorus to the body after the sphincter snap shut. So this whole process is called gastric emptying and again it takes six to eight hours for all the material to get mixed with your gastric juice and then slowly let through that pyloric sphincter like one little bit at a time. And why might we wanna do that? Well, it's going to allow for the maximum amount of exposure to the small intestine. And that small intestine has all of the chemicals that are going to finish up chemical digestion, and it has the cells that are going to do all of our significant nutrient absorption. So if we really make the process by which materials are introduced into the small intestine slow, then there's a lot of time to work your way through the small intestine, which is actually also quite long. So we can make the process quite lengthy and increase the time of exposure to the materials um, in the small, of, of our, those materials to our small intestine. So gross anatomy of the small intestine. The duodenum is gonna be the part that's receiving material from the stomach. It's also receiving bile and pancreatic juice. And then that's going to lead into the jejunum, which leads into the ileum. We talked about that last time. Microanatomy in the small intestine, we also kind of talked about last time. If we look at the wall of the small intestine, it does everything that it can do to increase surface area. So the first thing that it's going to do is if you look up at the cells on the surface of the epithelium, they all have microvilli. So each cell increases its own surface area by having microvilli. This is what gives us the name brush border for the epithelial surface in the small intestine. The small intestine is going to secrete brush border enzymes. And they're coming from these columnar cells. So it's again simple columnar epithelium. And these cells are going to secrete brush border enzymes. Muscularis externa that it did with the muscularis mucosae, which 
which is that it makes it smaller or shorter than the epithelium and the submucosa. So now we have to cinch those layers up on it. And so what we would see then is the appearance of these other folds. You can actually see these with your eyeballs. They're called circular folds. And that's the third way that we can increase surface area. Okay, these are good folds. These are due to folding of the mucosa and the submucosa. So if we start by thinking about the accessory gland secretions, then pancreatic juice is going to be introduced and it's going to have a bunch of stuff in it. It's going to have amylases, which break down our carbohydrates. It's going to have lipases that break down fats, proteases that break down proteins, nucleases that break down our nucleic acids. So pancreatic juice has a little bit of it all. So it contains amylases for carbohydrates, proteases for our polypeptides, and it's got uh, lipases for our lipids and nucleases for our uh, nucleic acids. Bile, really the most interesting thing about bile, is actually where we're going to concentrate our waste that the liver is pulling out of all this blood that the small intestine is going to absorb. So everything that gets absorbed through here is going to be brought into the body. So all the time the material is passing through the lumen of your GI tract, it's not really part of you. It's got to be pulled through your cells and be brought into the body. So when that happens in the small intestine, this kind of like dirty blood is going to go to the liver and get filtered. And all of those wastes are going to be concentrated in bile. But what's important for digestion is the bile contains what are called bile salts. And these are going to be important for lipid digestion. So these are going to actually help with, with what's called emulsification. So these emulsify fats. And I mean, what do we need to know? The pancreas is cool. I mean, it's so super important. This is the exocrine function uh, producing pancreatic juice and by those acinar cells that we talked about earlier, you first met them, the pancreas and the endocrine system because it's also got an endocrine part, those islets of Langerhans that secrete insulin and glucagon. So the pancreas is a super hugely important organ and um, it releases that pancreatic juice in an exocrine fashion in here that's going to help with most of our chemical digestion. And then the gallbladder is going to add, and, and liver are going to be able to add bile through this uh, common bile duct into the duodenum as well, and that's going to finish up our, um, not finish up, that's going to help with our fat digestion. So histologically, what do these things look like to be aware of? Uh, the pancreatic juice is coming from the pancreas, and in the pancreas it's the acinar cells that are exocrine cells that are producing pancreatic juice. So if you recall early in the semester, I said this was like a small group of big cells. They're cuboidal cells that are organized around a little ductule. 
And then the islet cells that are endocrine cells are like a big group of small cells all squashed together. So our ass and our cells are secreting our pancreatic juice. When you look histologically at the liver, it's super cool. I love the liver. I love the body, but the liver's pretty awesome. And if you look, it's organized into these like lobules around what's called a central vein. And those central veins are going to drain into hepatic veins. And then the hepatic veins are going to drain into the inferior vena cava and bring blood back to the heart after it's been cleaned by the liver. So this purple vein here is the hepatic portal vein. The hepatic portal vein is bringing in this blood that the small intestine is going to absorb and letting it run past these lobules in the liver so that the hepatocytes here can clean it. So how's that happening? There, what you'll be looking for when you're looking at the liver histology is you'll be looking for these things called portal triads. And what a portal triad is, is this little grouping of structures that are doing everything important that the liver needs to do for filtering blood and producing bile. So it's got a branch of the hepatic portal vein that'll probably be the biggest thing that you see. So it's the hepatic portal vein. And it's bringing in blood that's absorbed in the small intestine. I know that we're talking about digestive process in the small intestine still. How do we get over here? Because we're also talking about our accessory glands now that are going to help with this. And how we get bile is by filtering blood. The blood that we're filtering is this dirty blood that's coming from the small intestine through this hepatic portal vein. So we'll say this filters blood from small intestine capillaries. Normal capillaries. Forgot to talk about lacteals in microanatomy this time, but we'll talk about those more in a minute. So the hepatic portal vein is going to be bringing in this blood, or so that the hepatic portal vein is going to bring in blood from the small intestine that needs to be filtered past these hepatocytes so they can pull out waste and concentrate it in bile. So if we looked here, what we would see is that this dirty blood, if you will, is coming in through from this hepatic portal vein and filtering past our hepatocytes and is going to drain here in the central vein. What are our hepatocytes doing? They're pulling waste out of it because their job, the liver's job, is to clean the blood. They're going to then concentrate those wastes in bile. And so bile is going to be produced and go in the opposite direction. So the second part of a uh, or another part of the portal triad that you'll see is the bile ductule. And it's actually smaller than the hepatic portal vein. But, it, but I think histologically it's easier to see because the cells stain very differently. I, I don't know, in our cells they look purple. I, in our slides they look purple. So this is the bile ductule. And it collects bile from hepatocytes. And that's going to drain into our hepatic ducts. Then that's going to take it off to the gallbladder through the cystic duct, and then it's going to the cystic duct and hepatic duct merge to form the common bile duct, and that's what's going to bring the bile to the small intestine. All right, well, we call this a portal triad, and I only see two things, so we're very obviously missing something. What is it? Well, the liver has cells that need nutrient and gas exchange, so the third thing that you'll see is a branch of the hepatic artery and it's going to be bringing in the nutrient-rich blood and oxygen-rich blood that the liver needs. So this brings our oxygenated and nutrient-rich blood for nutrient and gas exchange for our hepatocytes. So this blood then is going to come past our hepatocytes, they're going to take everything they need and it's going to mix with this blood that's being filtered and both kinds of bloods are entering into the central veins. Our central veins are all going to ultimately empty into our hepatic veins. The hepatic veins empty into the inferior vena cava and now this clean blood is returned to the system. So, and we've produced our bile 
that is going to help with chemical digestion in the small intestine. So let's think about the digestive processes that are going on in the small intestine. And first, let me tell you, segmentation is occurring. And that's going to be that mechanical digestion, that side-to-side -side contraction that mixes chyme with brush border enzymes, or with the brush border so that we can have exposure to brush border enzymes and absorb. So when we think about chemical digestion, it might be good to think about what's coming into the small intestine in chyme as far as each biological macromolecule goes. Uh, so what are, what are those? Carbohydrates, proteins, lipids, nucleic acids. Okay, and what we're talking about right now are the digestive processes in the small intestine. And we said that the small intestine was secreting brush border enzymes. And it's finishing up chemical digestion. So our brush border enzymes are gonna get us down to kind of like the last parts of each of these things that we can absorb. And so what are the last parts? What are the smallest parts of carbohydrates? Just little individual sugars. So what we're trying to get to are the monomers. And in the case of our carbohydrates, those are monosaccharides. In the case of our proteins, the monomers are what? Amino acids. And you know what? Your brush border enzymes actually don't do anything to lipid digestion. Uh, that's all handled by pancreatic juice. For our nucleic acids, our brush border enzymes are going to get us down to our sugar uh, and our bases. So sugar, pentose, and our bases. Okay. All right, so that's what the small intestine is gonna be doing. Well, how do we get from here to there? Pancreatic juice and bile. So pancreatic juice is going to be added and help with the digestion of everything. It's really cool. So as far as what's coming in and our chyme as carbohydrates go, we started out with starches and polysaccharides in the mouth. Salivary amylase broke those into smaller polysaccharides, but then carbohydrate digestion stopped in the stomach. So in the small intestine, chyme contains polysaccharides and starches. So pancreatic juice is going to break those down into like eight sugars or less and, and all the way down to like two sugars, disaccharides. So it's gonna break us down to our um, oligosaccharides, disaccharides. So So oligo is eight, dye is two, so anywhere between two and eight sugars. And then now we have these little chains of sugars that are gonna brush up against this brush border and the brush border enzymes are gonna break down into little monosaccharides. Okay, what about what's the state of our proteins? So in the mouth, we didn't do any digestion of proteins, but in the stomach, we denatured our proteins using hydrochloric acid, and then our pepsin broke those uh, chains of amino acids down into polypeptides. So what's coming in in chyme are polypeptides, And again, pancreatic juice is going to break these down into um, smaller polypeptides. And then brush border enzymes are gonna break those down into our amino acids. So chyme had polypeptides, pancreatic juice is going to break those polypeptides into anywhere from dipeptides, which again is just two amino acids, to our oligopeptides eight amino acids. So now we have these chains of amino acids and they're gonna brush up against the brush border 
And our brush border enzymes are going to break those last bonds and break them down into their amino acids. And that'll be what we absorb. Now lipids are a little more complex because gastric juice is aqueous, we are aqueous, blood is aqueous, and lip lipids are not water soluble. So how are we going to digest them? And what's coming into the small intestine? In chyme, we still have a pretty large fat droplet. So it's a large fat droplet. So let's say it's just like a fat droplet, like that big. Well, in order for our enzymes to get in there and start breaking the bonds and break down to our free fatty acids and glycerol, which is what we're going to absorb, then we have to be able to just get in there at all. And so what's going to happen is now bile is actually going to be what helps. So what happens when we add bile is it emulsifies this fat. And I don't know if you've ever heard about the emulsifying action of detergents, but we've all washed pans that have grease on them and how the detergent gets the grease off your pan is it emulsifies it, it surrounds it, makes it water soluble. So that's what our bile salts are going to do. So our bile salts, salts emulsify this, so as we are doing that segmentation, these little contractions and moving this material back and forth and back and forth, then we're going to mix this large fat droplet with these bile salts and they're going to emulsify it. So that now pancreatic juice can get in there and start breaking the bonds in those chemicals. And so what that's going to do, we could say from here, so now pancreatic juice can get in there and break us down into our free fatty acids and glycerol. And those are going to get packaged into these little things called micelles. And those micelles are going to be absorbed through the intestinal wall kind of slightly differently. So this is lipid soluble. It's a lipid and the plasma membrane is lipid soluble. So what happens now in our small intestine cells is that these micelles are going to be absorbed. We're going to bring the fat through here, form these things called chylomicrons. And those chylomicrons are absorbed into lacteals. So up here, we're absorbing all of our amino acids into, um, and carbohydrates and nucleic acid for that matter, into normal capillaries. But with our lipids, it's slightly different. So for our lipid digestion, we'll say our bile salts emulsify it, which is going to allow pancreatic juice to get in there and break it down into free fatty acids and glycerol that get packaged into a micelle. So this is like micelle formation. And then that is going to be absorbed through the um, enterocytes or the small intestine cells. They're going to form these things called chylomicrons. And that's what's going to be absorbed into lacteals. So we'll talk more about that in just a minute when we get to absorption, but just be aware of that right now. Okay, so what else? Our last type is our nucleic acids. This is RNA and DNA. And no digestion of that begins until we get in the small intestine. And then what a pancreatic juice is going to kind of do our first step. Brush border enzymes finish it up. So just kind of put that in your back pocket. And that is the end of chemical digestion in the small intestine. Now, what about mechanical digestion in the small intestine? So we talked about motility in the small intestine before, and I said that not only did it do chemical digestion, but it did some mechanical digestion. Uh, and that is due to this process called segmentation, or this motility type segmentation. And those, again, are these like, if you think about it, your small intestine winds and winds and winds around on each other and or on itself and so you'll see these little side to side contractions of different parts of the small intestine that are going to allow the material passing through it to have the maximum amount of exposure to that brush border so that we can really do all of this great chemical digestion here at the end. All right. Questions?
Okay, so motility, segmentation is a type of motility. It's also a type of mechanical digestion. What's our major means of propulsion throughout the entire digestive system? Peristalsis, so that is gonna be how we move through the small intestine. So as far as motility goes, the two types of contractions that we have are the contractions that lead to the mechanical digestion called segmentation, but then we have propulsion due to peristalsis. So in the small intestine we have segmentation and peristalsis. Peristalsis is just what it always is, wave-like contraction of smooth muscle. All right, so we said the things that we needed to think about in every organ were specializations in the wall and what was being secreted and what was being digested, digested, and what motility there was and what was being absorbed. So what did we absorb in the small intestine? does all of our major nutrient absorption. But if we're thinking about specifically what are we absorbing, we're absorbing amino acids. And these are going into normal capillaries. We absorb monosaccharides. And these two are going into normal capillaries. These capillaries are going to the hepatic portal system. What's a portal system? It's when blood goes through two capillary beds before returning to the general circulation. So here's our first capillary bed in the small intestine and our second capillary bed in the liver. So we go to the hepatic portal system and then we get introduced back into our blood just, you know, normally. Okay, well, in our lipids, we are not being absorbed into normal capillaries. And what we're absorbing through the small intestine are those little chylomicron things. And they're just these little things that contain free fatty acids and glycerol. And those are going to be absorbed by lacteals. So our chylomicrons are absorbed, it's free fatty acids and glycerol. And these are being absorbed into lacteals. Who remembers what lacteals are? They're the specialized lymphatic capillaries we said that helped with lipid absorption. So we're going to absorb all of those fats into lacteals. Those lacteals are going to drain into the cisterna chile, and now all of those lipids are going to drop into the thoracic duct, which is going to return that lipid-rich blood, which is going to return that lipid-rich material now right to your left subclavian vein. Your left subclavian vein is draining into your brachiocephalic vein, which is draining into your superior vena cava and is going out to your pulmonary circuit, which means that it's then gonna hit your lungs and come back to your heart and hit your systemic circuit all the way out till it gets back to your hepatic artery where the liver can then filter out the fats. So just think about that when you're eating fats. Like that is hugely physiologically significant that the fats that you eat are absorbed first just right into these lacteals that are going to return this ultimately into the fluid that drains right into your blood. So your liver can do things with fats. It's called the lipid shuttle. There's a whole lipid shuttle system you can read about some other time, uh, but it can't do anything with it until it gets them, and it doesn't get those fats until we go almost all the way through the systemic circuit. It's crazy. So, okay, chylomicrons are absorbed, and then these are going to be absorbed into lacteals, which are going to drain into the cisterna chile, which is going to drain into the thoracic duct, which is going to drain into your left subclavian vein. Pretty crazy. So other things that we're absorbing in the small intestine, vitamins, minerals, water, 
drugs. So whatever you bring into your GI tract, the significant absorption of that is happening in your small intestine. So be aware of that. And what's going on in the large intestine? So we already talked about the gross anatomy. From a microanatomy perspective, the only thing that's really interesting is that it's got a high number of goblet cells. And that's because goblet cells secrete mucus. And what we're doing in the large intestine, really the big function is to reclaim as much water as possible. So we're gonna absorb a lot of water in here and solidify our waste. So the function of the large intestine is going to be to absorb water and solidify waste for excretion. It's also going to be able to absorb vitamin B and K. Okay, <laughs> so um, microanatomy. Increased number of goblet cells, and that's because we need to have uh, a lot of mucus to lubricate our solid waste. Okay, so the large intestine, all on its own, just secretes a bunch of mucus. That's its secretion. Specializations in its wall, nothing really. It's just got a lot of goblet cells in the epithelium. Uh, digestion, it's not really doing any digestion of its own. So what's going on here? Uh, we actually live in this symbiotic relationship with a bunch of bacteria in our gut called our bacterial flora and these are going to use our undigested and indigestible materials they eat it up and then they release uh, vitamins B and vitamins K that we can then absorb and they also release methane which is what gives rise to flatus and everybody has characteristic flatus because their bacterial flora has been populating their gut like their entire life. So, bacterial flora, these are, uh, we'll say they're symbiotic, and what they do is they digest our undigested or indigestible, undigestible, indigestible, whatever, we can't take care of it. I can't even spell this word now. Material. <laughs> and they're going to release vitamins and methane. And then we can absorb those vitamins. Now this symbiotic relationship is so important to the normal functioning of your digestive system and your normal ability to do everything that like if you get your bacterial flora wiped out, people will actually have poop transplants. It's your brain break for the day. You can get a poop transplant if you need it. You may have heard if you've ever talked to some people about, you know, traveling to some other country, they'll be like, don't drink the water. And the reason they're saying that is because sometimes water can have these uh, bacteria that can wipe out your bacterial flora, and just clean you out. And then when that happens, like you have poo problems for a long time. Like I've heard that you just like, like you eat and then like are immediately like just excreting all of your like, this really like liquidy waste and it's really hard to um, poo normally and you don't really appreciate how good it is to poo normally until you can't poo normally, I guess. So yeah, they, this is so important to your normal homeostasis that people will actually get poo transplants. And so and you can take poo pills. <laughs> so they'll try and get it from somebody who is in your environment so it's most similar to what it was you had. So this was another like thought journey me and my ex took one day trying to figure out where do you get your bacterial flora? How does that populate your gut? And uh, it's actually that it comes from your mom. So when you're being born and going down your mom's vagina, the birth canal, all of that is like rubbing on your face and your eyes, your nose and all the bacteria and they're being introduced to your body and that's what populates your gut. So I had one child naturally and one child uh, by C-section and this is another thing that I noticed 
that he was allergic, he had like sensitivities. He had sensitivity to peas, cantaloupe, all this stuff. And she, who was born normally, didn't. So this is kind of just another one of those really interesting things. And they say that babies who are C, born by C-section have, they can set up a normal colony of bacterial flora with skin-to-skin -skin contact because there's bacteria all over mom's skin. So that's why skin-to-skin -skin contact is so important. But I don't know, I don't, I don't know if it's the same. I would say that from my life experience, it is not it's kind of interesting thing to be aware of. Okay. So as far as motility in the large intestine, what do we have going on? We have peristalsis, like we do everywhere. And it's just moving things forward in a wave-like contraction kind of manner. Then we have those hostral contractions. And what happens in a hostral contraction is that um, a hostrum will contract and move material from one hostrum to the next. So if each of these little segments is a hostrum, a hostral contraction would be like this contracts and moves material to this hostrum. And then this one contracts and moves material to this hostrum. So those are hostral contractions. And what we can say about a hostral contraction is that it propels material from one hostrum to the next. You can write that down while I fumble with this. Hostral contractions move material from one hostrum to the next. And the reason I struggle bust it with this model while you were writing all of that down is because the last type is a mass movement and it starts here in the transverse colon. One to three times a day, you'll have a mass movement that originates here and it starts with this forceful contraction that propels material forward. So then what happens is you should have the material that's in your sigmoid colon should move into your rectum and then you should have a bowel movement. So mass movement should lead to a bowel movement. And that's our last type. So our last type of motility in the large intestine is a mass movement. These occur one to three times a day. And they're forceful contractions originating in the transverse colon. They propel material from the sigmoid colon to the rectum. And then you should get some sensory signals and defecate. Okay, so mass movements lead to defecation. What's that? Well, when this material goes from your sigmoid colon into the rectum, it's going to stimulate tactile receptors that are going to tell a sensory neuron. It's going to send that information back to your spinal cord. It's a reflex, so it's handled through the spinal cord. You can train it, which means that your cerebrum's involved until you really get good at it, and then you can still control it. So what happens if this is our rectum, like leading into the anal canal, that as we stretch here, this increase in stretch is going to send information back and your, your parasympathetic nervous system will send out commands that will relax your internal anal sphincter. And then if you have trained it, you can exert skeletal muscle control over your external anal sphincter and hold it until it's convenient to evacuate. And then once it is, you go to the bathroom and you uh, sit on the pot, maybe you spray your poopery, I don't know, but you send down these voluntary commands to the skeletal muscle there in the external anal sphincter and then your internal anal sphincter will relax and you can void. That's my favorite part of my job, right there. That was a lie. Okay, so let's wrap it all up. Let's sum it all up and be done with the digestive system. Okay, so what's going on? Let's look at each step along the way for the physiology of our digestion and our absorption. All right, the light is changing. Things are getting hard but we're almost done. Let's sum it up and make a chart. So we're gonna look at 
The physiology of digestion and absorption for carbohydrates, proteins, and lipids are major biological macromolecule types. So carbohydrate digestion begins in the mouth. And this is where our salivary amylase is added. And what we'll start with is that we've got these big starches and they'll be broken down into smaller starches or polysaccharides. There's no carbohydrate digestion in the stomach. In the small intestine, these polysaccharides are going to be taken down to disaccharides all the way up to oligosaccharides by pancreatic juice. And then our brush border enzymes are going to take those disaccharides all the way up to oligosaccharides and get those down to our monosaccharides. And our monosaccharides, like glucose, is what we're absorbing into normal capillaries that are going to the hepatic portal system. Okay, for proteins, there is no protein digestion in the mouth. I mean mechanical digestion, but chemical digestion, no protein digestion in the mouth. What happens here is hydrochloric acid is going to denature them. And then pepsin, which got activated from pepsinogen, is going to break these into polypeptides. These polypeptides are going to enter the small intestine. Our pancreatic juice is going to break them down into dipeptides all the way up to oligopeptides, meaning that they can have two to eight amino acids. And then our brush border enzymes are, absor are digesting those uh, dipeptides to oligopeptides down into amino acids. And the amino acids are what we are absorbing into normal capillaries. Okay, for lipid digestion, in the mouth, we added lingual lipase, but it wasn't active until the stomach. And then we added in the stomach gastric lipase, but their digestion is pretty insignificant. So really, our significant lipid digestion began in the small intestine when we had this large fat droplet that got emulsified by our bile salts. Our pancreatic juice could get in there then and start digesting it, breaking it down into our free fatty acids and glycerol. Those get packaged into these things called micelles. The micelles are absorbed into the small intestine um, cells, the columnar cells there, the enterocytes, and those are, they're going to form into these things called chylomicrons that are absorbed into lacteals. And the small intestine is also where we're digesting our nucleic acids. I'm not going to worry about the details of that. The small intestine is also where we're absorbing our vitamins and water, our minerals, so like everything else. So uh, we do a lot of water and vitamin abs absorption in the small intestine. But then the large intestine does a lot of water and vitamin absorption as well. Specifically, the large intestine is going to do vitamins B and K, and it's going to do a lot of water as well. Oh, that's just another like interesting fact. If you've ever like had a baby or aware that one of the first things they do is give them a shot of vitamin K. And the reason they give them that is because vitamin K is necessary for blood clotting. And so if little babies get a nick, they're not going to be able to form a blood clot because they don't have vitamin K. The reason they don't have vitamin K is because they haven't established their gut flora yet. So they don't have the gut flora releasing the vitamin K for them. So pretty darn interesting. And that wraps up the digestive system. Thanks for being here.